This is the gospel according to Luke, chapter 12, verses 49 to 53. Listen now to the word of the Lord. I came to cast a fire on the earth, and would that they were already kindled. I have a baptism, a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to bring peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, and one in, on, in one, on in one house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, there are a lot of um, popular misconceptions that are going around about Jesus, about who Jesus is, about what his personality is like. And they've, they've been around for a long time. And probably since Jesus first came to the earth, there were a lot of misconceptions about him. And one of the most popular we have today is one that I think is summed up very well in a Woody Guthrie song. It's a, he's an old folk singer, probably maybe the grandfather of American folk music. And he had a song called Jesus Christ. And in one of the verses it said, Jesus said to the rich, give your money to the poor. So they laid Jesus Christ in his grave. That he said to the rich, give your money to the poor. So they laid Jesus Christ in his grave. And the misconception is that the reason why Jesus was killed was because he was a nice guy. That he was just this nice guy and he wanted you to do nice things. And I've had people tell me that before. They said, you know, Christianity is just about being nice to people. That's all you have to do, just be nice to people. And all Jesus did was propose this real nice thing. Tell these rich people that have a whole lot of money. And he just told them to share some of it with the poor. And so they killed him for it. They killed Jesus for being a nice guy. And there's two misconceptions here. And the first one is that they killed him for being a nice guy. And the second misconception is going to be a little bit harder to believe. Is that Jesus really isn't that nice of a guy. He's not. I mean, listen, okay, the, the, I don't want you to think that I don't think Jesus is a nice guy, Okay. He's kind, he's merciful, he's forgiving, he's meek, and he's humble. And there are so many things that are nice about him. But think for a minute when you think of somebody who's a nice guy or a nice girl. I mean, what is it about them? Or what are the main qualities that make somebody nice? I mean, usually it's they're easy to get along with and they're agreeable. That's what makes somebody nice is, is they're agreeable. They don't, they don't start fights with us. They don't rock the boat. They don't say a lot of things that are controversial. They're always kind of smoothing things out. You know, they, they don't offend anybody. They're nice. They're very agreeable people. And we like being around them because they don't, well, they don't disturb us a whole lot. I mean, they don't challenge us either. But they're the ones out there kind of in the background just well, just being nice. And see, that's not always who Jesus is. Jesus can be nice. But that's not really his character is being nice. See, sometimes Jesus is very hard to get along with. If you've tried to get along with them, you'll know what I'm talking about. Jesus can be very hard to get along with. He can be very disagreeable sometimes. He can make us very uncomfortable. He rocks the boat all the time, and many times Jesus is downright offensive. Now, if you don't believe me about this, I will present to you today's scripture passage as a case in point of sometimes how Jesus is not a nice guy. He says some very disagreeable things to us in scripture today. 
He said that he came to cast fire on the earth. He said, I'm going to burn it down. I'm bringing fire with me today. And then he even, he even addressed a misconception. He says, do you think I've come to bring peace? Is that what you think? Because I haven't. I haven't come to bring peace. I've come to bring division. In the Gospel of Matthew, he gives us a, a different image in the same passage. He says, I haven't come to bring peace. I've come to bring a sword. Because that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to divide things up. I'm going to create some conflict here. And it's going to not only divide things, I'm going to find the people that are closest to you, and I'm going to divide you as well. Mothers and fathers. Mothers with their, with their daughters. Fathers with their sons. Mothers-in-laws with their daughters-in-laws. Well, that's not that hard to believe. But you get his point. He is coming to bring division. This is not a nice Jesus. This is combative Jesus. This is rude Jesus. This is warlike Jesus. This is offensive Jesus. This is the Jesus that commands legions and legions of angels. This is the Jesus that fought with demons and cast them out. This is Jesus that strode into the temple and turned over the tables of the money changers and making a whip himself began to whip and beat people and chase them out of the temple. Now we're not crazy really about this Jesus. We prefer nice Jesus. We prefer agreeable Jesus. We prefer make us feel good Jesus. The, my burden is easy and my yoke is light Jesus. This is come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden Jesus. We like that Jesus. That's the comfortable Jesus. That's the nice Jesus. This is a, another side to our Savior. This is the Jesus that came to the Pharisees and he asked them, how do you expect to escape the fires of hell? It's not nice at all. In fact, that's a Jesus that we could call dangerous Jesus. And to understand Jesus is to understand both of those. Nice Jesus and also dangerous Jesus. We have Jesus who is redeemer of the world, the forgiver of our sins. That's nice Jesus. We have Jesus who is also the judge of the world, who will condemn those that are not in him. Dangerous Jesus. We have the Jesus who is meek and lowly and humble, that's nice Jesus. We have the Jesus that is bold and full of the power of heaven. That's dangerous Jesus. And we have Jesus who is the sacrificial lamb. The one that did not fight or struggle, but allowed himself to be slaughtered by others. But there's also the Jesus who will come to the earth again, riding a white horse with a sword coming out of his mouth, and he will lead a slaughter of his own. That's dangerous, Jesus. Now, we prefer nice Jesus for good reason. Dangerous Jesus is out of our control. It's like being in the middle of a storm. You're faced with this incredible power, and we're helpless beneath it, and you don't know what he is going to do next. One of my favorite uh, illustrations or images of Jesus comes from C.S. Lewis. His children's story, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And in this story, Jesus appears as a lion, and his name is Aslan. And he, he's a good lion, and he does lots of good things. He's very nice, but he's also a lion. And you can never forget that he is a lion. And there's this great line in the story where Aslan is leaving, and two of the characters are talking about him. And they say he's a good lion, but he's not a tame one. So he's a good lion but he's not a tame lion. Jesus is a good Savior, but he's not a tame one. He's a wild one, and sometimes a dangerous one. Yes, he is the Prince of Peace, 
And yes, one day he will institute a reign of peace upon the world, but he is also the one that brings division and sword and fire to the earth. It's hard sometimes in our mind to reconcile these two images of Jesus, the nice Jesus and the dangerous Jesus. But they're both Jesus. And we need to see him as both the nice Savior of the world and the dangerous judge and redeemer of the world. He's the nice redeemer of our lives, but also he is the dangerous transformer and even at times destroyer of our lives. And he's being both these things because this is how he can bring about God's mission in the world. It's being nice Jesus and dangerous Jesus. Because if he is going to be our savior, If Jesus is truly going to be our Savior, that means he must be in conflict with the world. Okay, To be a Savior, Jesus has to be in conflict in the world. In the same way, if we're his people, we also have to be in conflict with the world. Now, I've just thrown out a loaded term to you. I realize that, the world. And in Christian theology and circles and in the Bible, you keep reading this phrase, this, the world. The world is evil. The world is corrupt. The world is awful. Separate yourself from the world. You have to be in the world, but not of the world. And for some, it's confusing kind of terminology, like the world. I thought God created the world. And then he said it was good. How, how is the world bad? Well, when we use the phrase the world, we're not talking about the earth. Okay, it's not the physical globe of the earth with the seas and the rivers and the trees and the mountains. It doesn't talk about, it doesn't mean the people of the earth. It doesn't even mean all of our societies and institutions when they say the world. What we mean by the world is the way of life and the values that were created by a sinful humanity. That's what the world is. It's a way of life and it's a set of values that were created And they're propagated and encouraged and lived today by a sinful humanity. And and we know what those values are. We we see them at play in the world all the time. We're talking about values like greed and power. Values like ambition and fame. It's these values where I'm, I'm pleasing myself no matter what. It's the values of getting ahead at all costs. And these are very much alive in the world and have very much been alive, well, as long as humanity has walked the earth. And these are the values and the way of life we talk about when we say the world. And, you know, we're always seeing stories about these values coming out, you know, these these big controversies, you know, with these stories of these big institutions or famous people that get caught in corruption. I mean, every week, every week, another story's coming out. And, and, and it's getting to the point where we should be believing that this is their normal mode of operation, is through these corrupt values of the world. And, and we, we hear about them all the time, and, and we're surprised. We're always surprised when somebody high in power falls from glory, or we find out this big institution has been promoting these awful values for years, and we're like shocked. Like, oh, how did that happen? And it's because their values are the values of the world. They're corrupt values. And they always end up producing corruption. And we should never be surprised at it. Because that's the way the world operates. And a church isn't immune. It happens to churches all the time. It happens to churches all the time. And, and you know, they start off good. At least I believe they do. I believe they start off good. They start off innocent. They start off with with good intentions. Then they get bigger. They get more popular. They get richer. Then they start chasing more money, bigger venues, more influence, the big TV contracts, the fame, the influence, the ability to be the advisor to presidents, to be opening the prayer at the inauguration, to be the big preacher to be the popular one, and before you know it, scandal hits. 
a scandal hits and we're always surprised. We're like, what were they thinking? What were they thinking by doing this? You know what always surprises me with these scandals, especially the churches? What surprises me is, how do they get away with it for so long? I mean, sometimes it goes on for years. There was a, it was a, a real famous church, Hillsong. I mean, they found out that they've been using like their employees and their members for like slave labor for the pastors. I mean, part of me is like, how do they pull that off? I mean, gosh, they must really like their pastor. But, but no, seriously, though, the, the other part of me is like, how do they get away with it for so long? For five years, 10 years, sometimes more than that. And nobody's saying, hey, wait a minute. Are we sure we should be doing this? Do these reflect Christ-like values? And it goes in the world. I mean, Harvey Weinstein, I mean, what, 20 years, 30 years? He was a predator to women, and everybody knew it. It was, a, it was, the, it was the, uh, what is it, the, um, the secret that everybody knew in Hollywood. Like, how does it go for that long? It's because those are the values of the world. These are the values that the world promotes, and they will always produce corruption. The values of the world will always lead to corruption. Now, I've gotten that soapbox for a good reason. Because the way of the world is not the way of Christ. The values and the ideas that the, and the life that the world promotes is not the life that Christ is promoting in us. And the two ways, they're, they're mingling in, in, in the earth right now, but they can't coexist forever. That's what Jesus said. He says, you can't serve two masters. You're going to love one and you're going to hate the other. And in that passage, he meant, he meant God and money, but he might as well have said the values of God and the values of the world. Because if you trace the values of the world long enough, you will almost always come back to money. And you can't serve both. Because the way of Christ is the way of life. That's why he did what he did, is to give us life. The Gospel of John, he says, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. And again in John, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Any who believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And once more in John, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. The reason Jesus came to this earth is to give us life. He's to give you life, true life, not not just biological life that is born one day and dies the next, but to instill in you and to foster in you and to encourage and culture in you the life that never ends. That was why he came. That's why he preached and allowed himself to be killed and rose again. So that you and me and all of us, we could have the true life. So his way is the way of life. And anything that is not of Christ, anything that stands against Christ, is the way of death. And you have it, the way of life and the way of death. All the way back in Deuteronomy, God said that to his people. He says, I present to you today life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life that you may live. There's always been those two ways, the way of God, the way of Christ, and the way of life, and the way of the world, which is the way of death. And this is why Jesus must be dangerous. He is a danger to the way of the world. He is a danger to the way of sin and to evil and corruption of sinful humanity. This is why Jesus comes to bring division. He divides us from death to separate us from corruption and decay. And if he has to separate us from the things that we love that drag us down into death, he will separate us from that as well. If he has to separate the, uh, the mothers from their daughters and fathers from their sons and from our best friends and from the people we love the most, if they're the ones that are pulling us into the way of death, Jesus will divide us from that. He will divide us from everything that opposes the way of Christ. This is why Jesus must come and cast fire on the world. He's going to burn away all the things that belong to the kingdom of death going to scorch the earth to make way for the kingdom of God. That's why we can't serve two masters. One master is the master of life. One master is the master of death. 
You can't serve both of those masters. They, 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 they contradict each other. They destroy each other. You can only serve one or the other. And we try. I mean, let's be honest. We, we try. We try to serve both. Because in our hearts, we're always like, you know, I want to do what I want whenever I want. But I want that to end up in eternal life at the same time. Can I do that? Is that an option? Just to live the life the way I want to and to serve and to love who I want, but I'll end up getting eternal life anyway? That sounds, that sounds like a nice way to do it. Why can't God do that? Because that's like asking God, can I serve death and end up at life? Can I do that? Can I live my life in the way of death and somehow end up at life? To kind of make the analogy more immediate, it would be like this. Suppose you're about to get married, and the person you're marrying says, okay, this is the deal I want. I want to live in a house that is nurturing, and it's comfortable, and it's nice, and I can always come back, and you'll always be there for me, to provide for me, and to help feed me, and to encourage me. But I also want to live as if I'm single. Can I do that? Is that an option? I mean, come on, honestly, I think all of us would be like, nah, that's a hard no. You can't do both. If you want the nurture of a home, you have to build a home. In physical ways and spiritual ways also. If you want that nurture, you have to build it. If you want life, you have to follow the way of life. If Jesus brings division... Is to divide us from all that is dying and to set us aside for life. If Jesus comes casting fire, it's to burn the chaff of sin from our soul so only the good wheat is left behind. See, Woody Guthrie had it wrong. The world has it wrong, and sometimes even the church gets it wrong on this one. They didn't kill Jesus because he was too nice. They killed him because he was too dangerous. They killed him because he came casting fire to burn away all that was evil in the world and to bring the life, the glory, the righteousness of God. And he's dangerous still today because he's still casting fire on the world. He's still casting it on his people, and he's still dividing us from all that is evil and death. And to all those of you who want a comfortable life, and that's all you want, you will find that Jesus is dangerous. Because he will cast a fire on you that will make you unsatisfied with anything but him. And if all you want is a safe life, We'll find that Jesus is dangerous to that as well. He will cast a fire on you that puts you into direct conflict with the world. If all you want is prosperity and ease, you will find Jesus to be very dangerous. He will cast a fire on you that will lay bare the poverty of a soul without Christ. But if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will find his yoke is easy and his burden is light. You will find that if you come seeking him, you will find. If you knock, the door will be open to you. And if you're willing to take his way upon you, you will find he is one of the nicest people you will ever meet. But whatever you do, don't forget. Never forget. He's a good Savior, but He's never tame. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, will you pray with me?